Today we're going to take a look at one of the Maryborough District's most remarkable mines, the Grand Duke, and a shocking accident which occurred here back in 1883 which claimed the lives of four men. This impressive deep lead mine operated for 27 years in the late 19th century under several company names, the Duke and Timor, Duchess of Timor, Duke, and finally Grand Duke as we know it today. Over almost three decades of operation, this mine extracted 216,000 ounces of gold from ancient riverbeds which were deeply buried here, and it was one of the most important mines in the district, employing hundreds of men over its lifetime. Today the mine is known for its striking remains of its huge pump house. One of the biggest obstacles faced in this area was the groundwater. Mining at depth here was almost impossible. Ordinary pumps couldn't keep up, so Duke and Timor imported a massive Cornish pumping engine from England, one of the biggest in the world at the time. The pump's huge iron beam weighed 30 tonnes and sat upon this arch which acted as a fulcrum. This pump lifted 2,000 gallons of water every minute, and for many years the water raised from underground kept the Bet Bet Creek running permanently. As well as this incredible pump, the mine also boasted four main shafts, 12 Cornish boilers and eight iron puddling machines. The puddlers were processing the alluvial material of the ancient riverbed, and we can still see the piles of washed river rocks right here beside the shaft. You may wonder, if the shaft was there and the pebble dump is right next to it, where were the puddling machines? Well, look up. This mine had aerial puddlers set up high near the top of the poppet head, as we can see in this photo. These elevated puddlers were designed to allow discharge of material from the bottom of the machines. The puddled wash dirt was directed into sluices, and the worthless pebbles and stones were dumped into piles below. The finer sluice tailings were then washed away in a slurry. The puddling house was supported by long wooden stilts, and we can still see remnants of them here today. A stamp battery also operated here, and although these machines might make you think of quartz mining operations, here at this mine it was being used to crush something else. This is a piece of the lead which ran deep underground through this area. Parts of the ancient riverbed were cemented together over time, trapping the gold in this solid mass. This stuff was crushed up to release the gold it held. Something else I'll mention before moving on is that we usually hear the term poppet head referring to the entire steel or wooden structure over a shaft. In this video, you will hear the plural term poppet heads, which was used to refer only to the part at the very top which supported the sheave wheels. Now, mining was certainly a dangerous occupation. Most substantial mines saw their share of accidents, deaths and disasters, and this one was no exception. While sinking a shaft here in 1869, the miners reached 125 feet, and the moment they struck the bottom, it violently burst upward, and a surging mass of drift, sand, mud and water began to rush up the shaft with a fearful velocity. The men had to flee upwards to escape the rising mass, which ascended with them to within 40 feet of the surface. A man who was going down to repair the pump in 1891 slipped and fell down the ladderway, a distance of 191 feet. He landed in the cistern where his broken and lifeless body was drawn into a pipe by the powerful pump, obstructing operation. There were also three separate catastrophic cave-ins underground here, which claimed the lives of five men. Over the lifetime of this mine, 12 men were killed over seven separate accidents, and there were plenty more injuries and near misses, including a narrowly avoided boiler explosion in 1877. But there's one particular accident which we're going to take a closer look at today. And for this, we're going to head over to the mine's third shaft, 
and look back to Tuesday the 18th of December, 1883. Now, I've got to put a warning in here. This was a terrible accident which took the lives of four men in a dreadful manner. I'm about to describe what happened to them in detail, so if you're uncomfortable hearing graphic accounts, I advise that you give the next few minutes of this video a miss and skip to the next chapter. It was about quarter past eight in the morning and the 8am shift change was underway as usual. Exhausted miners were being brought up from underground while the new shift was being sent down to start work below. Engine driver John Jones, who had always been considered a steady and careful operator, had just started winding for the day. A group of miners were standing around the poppet head, some who had just come up and others who were waiting to go down. Most of the men had already been lowered and four truckers were ready to enter the cage. A fellow named Metcalf intended to go down but stepped aside at the last moment to light his pipe and another young miner took his place. So their four men stood in the cage, Whiteley, Rogan, Rogers and Jones, when the braceman Doyle gave the signal to the engine driver to lower as he had done so many times before. The winding engine was set in motion, but to the surprise of everyone present, the cage, instead of descending, was suddenly drawn upwards. There had clearly been some mistake. The braceman Doyle immediately signalled the engine driver to stop, but for some reason, no heed was paid. He repeatedly signalled with increasing urgency, but to no effect. The engine driver seemed oblivious. Surprise quickly turned to terror as the engine did not stop. Everyone was shouting as the cage and its horrified occupants passed the brace and continued their ascent towards the popperheads. It climbed higher and higher, and with a sudden crash, it violently struck the detaching bar. The safety hook let go, and before anyone could even process what was happening, The cage with its living freight had dropped down the skids like a shot and disappeared with a terrifying velocity into the shaft below. It took about five seconds for the cage, weighing half a ton, and its terrified occupants to fall some 400 feet into the depths of the earth, from as high as they could get to as low as they could go, smashing into the bottom of the shaft at almost 200 kilometers an hour. Those present at the surface were simply in shock. The news of the incident immediately spread and hundreds of men assembled on the mine, along with crowds of anxious and tearful women who rushed to find out whether their relatives had been among the unfortunate miners in the cage. Everyone was deeply affected and the scene at the mouth of the shaft was heartrending. The mine manager and the captain of the shift were lowered down to the bottom where a sickening scene presented itself. They found the four unlucky men smashed to pieces, their bodies so severely crushed and mutilated that they were almost entirely beyond recognition. Their feet were actually split with the force of their fall and even though each man wore heavy laced boots when they went down, their feet were quite bare when recovered and fragments of their shoes were found lying about the shaft in tatters. A great deal of difficulty was experienced by the men in extracting them from the mangled cage. The remains were painstakingly gathered up and sent to the surface to the horror-stricken crowd which was gathered at the top. Broken bones and mangled limbs were delivered at the mouth of the shaft in four trucks as blood poured from them in a sickening stream. Smaller fragments of the men had to be scraped up and placed in candle boxes. The bodies were conveyed through the mortified crowd and taken to the miners' changing room. One of the men who was underground at the time of the accident had witnessed the terrible scene unfold at the bottom. He said he saw the cage smash down 
and two seconds later, another body fell on top of it. It appeared that after the cage reached the detaching bar at the poppet heads, Whiteley had endeavoured to escape by jumping out. But he must have hit the side of the compartment and been thrown down again, following the cage the whole way to the bottom. At the surface, marks were found where he'd tried to obtain a hold on the partition between the two compartments, and the marks of his fingers could be plainly seen for some feet down the shaft, where he desperately tried to take hold as he fell. Whiteley's body was the most mutilated of them all. How on earth did this happen? Signals were given to the winder driver who could have stopped the engine at any time with a powerful brake. Furthermore, the cage in use was a safety cage, and the moment it detached at the poppet heads, strong grippers should have acted, which would have immediately stopped the cage in its descent. To top it off, new regulations had just come in, which required all mines to have special safety catches installed below the poppet heads to stop the fall of a cage in the event of overwinding. And yet here these men were, laid out in a mangled mess in wet sacking in the miners' change room. The community was horrified. The incident was widely reported on, and the tragedy was felt deeply in the Maryborough district, as well as over in Ballarat, where news of the disaster was received with a great deal of distress. The Duke Company's mine was one of the most popular at Ballarat's famous corner, and many local mining investors were connected with it. The Duke Company's name was as familiar in Ballarat as though it had actually been situated there. Everyone wanted to know how such a dreadful accident could have occurred. A jury of practical miners was impanelled, and an inquest was quickly held on site to examine and identify the dead. The inquest was then continued at Dempster's Junction Hotel in Timor. So what did that inquest find? While the immediate blame rested on the shoulders of John Jones, the engine driver, who somehow failed to act when he could have stopped the engine at any time. When asked what had happened at the time, he could give no coherent answer. Aside from claiming that a man in the doorway had blocked his view of the cage, confusing and distracting him, he could offer no good explanation as to why he had failed to stop the cage in its ascent. He would have heard the signals, and not only this, there were several indicators in the winding room which plainly showed the position of the cage, regardless of whether the cage was in his sight or not. His actions, or lack thereof, caused many to suppose he was out of his mind at the time, and no better explanation was ever really given as to why this previously attentive and careful driver had made such a terrible mistake. But the overwinding was not the only factor here. That cage should have engaged strong brakes as soon as it began to fall. So let's take a closer look at safety cages, how they work and why this one didn't on that fateful day. Safety cages were the subject of interest to many inventors. And while many different models were devised and employed in mines, they typically worked off the same basic principle. The weight of the cage when suspended by a rope compresses a heavy spring, which held the brakes or grippers off the skids. If the tension from the rope relaxed, such as in the event of the winding cable breaking or becoming detached, the spring suddenly expands, forcing the grippers to hold tight on the skids, preventing the cage from falling. In the event of overwinding, a safety hook at the top was designed to release the winding cable when the hook was raised to a detaching bar, preventing the cage from being drawn all the way to the sheave wheels at the top. The idea being that the safety hook would detach and the spring brakes would then immediately stop the fall of the cage. When these cages worked, they worked very well. When they didn't, the result could be catastrophic. Many miners were of the opinion that safety cages were death traps, giving a false sense of security, which could cause lapses in maintenance and proper inspection of machinery. 
Regulations required all mines to have safety hooks and cages, but there were no regulations dictating which ones should be used, leaving it up to the mining companies to select their cages out of the many which were in circulation. The cage used at the Duke mine was an Allen safety cage and hook invented by Robert Allen of Ballarat. Allen's cage evolved through several variations, and the one used at the Duke Company had large serrated grippers to halt the descent of a falling cage. Allen created an early working model of his invention in 1873, which won first prize at the Smeaton Show the next year. It was later put on display at the Ballarat School of Mines, which eventually evolved into today's Federation University. That 150-year-old model of Allen's safety cage is still held in the Federation University Historical Collection. So let's go take a closer look. This model is set up in a wooden frame with a detaching bar at the top. In the event of overwinding, the safety hook passes through here and releases the cable, preventing the cage from ascending all the way to the poppet heads at the top. As soon as the weight of the cage is no longer compressing the spring underneath, the brakes are forced on, which grab hold of the skids running down the shaft. These brakes are designed to act in any situation where the cage is free falling, with no weight acting on the spring. Allen's safety cage was tested in the late 1870s in an inquiry on safety mining cages and was considered by Mr. Nicholas, the senior inspector of mines, to be one of the most successful cages in the trial. After being sent down the shaft at full speed, the moment the brakes engaged, the cage did not move more than one tenth of an inch further in its descent. There were only three recorded instances where an Allen's cage failed in an emergency. Unfortunately, the accident at the Duke Company was one of them. So what happened? It was reported that the safety hook had acted splendidly, detaching the cage from the winding cable rather than raising it to the wheels above. But if the grippers on the cage aren't going to engage and no other safety appliances are installed, a so-called splendidly operating detaching hook is basically a death sentence to any miner who is unfortunate enough to be on board. Robert Allen, the inventor of the cage, was soon on the scene to inspect the remains of his device, and he found that several teeth on the grippers were worn down. It was noted that although Allen's patent hook and cage were in use, the spring was not Allen's. It had been manufactured independently at the Duke Mine. An inspection of the shaft revealed that the skids were very hard, and the grippers would need to be particularly sharp to have held sufficiently. The skids were also worn very smooth and glossy, which may have affected the gripping capability of the cage. There were marks on the skids in two places where the grippers had engaged and tried to break. The first was up near the top between the detaching bar and the brace, almost immediately after the cage began to fall and the second was a hundred feet below the surface, where they merely grazed the skids for about three feet before the cage continued to fall completely unchecked all the way to the bottom. Mr. Nicholas, senior inspector of mines, assessed the situation and determined that the new safety regulations which had recently come into effect had not been complied with which required automatic spring catches or tumblers to be fixed below the poppet heads to prevent the cage from falling down the shaft in the event of overwinding. There was no such catch in place at the Duke mine at the time of the accident. The mine manager showed the inspector the blacksmith's workshop where a device was partially constructed which would have entirely satisfied the requirements. Had this catch been fitted below the poppet heads, this disaster would have been little more than a hiccup in the day's operations, a minor delay with no loss of life. The inquest at Dempster's Junction Hotel examined all the evidence, questioned all who were involved, and came back with a shocking verdict. 
John Jones, the engine driver, was found guilty of manslaughter, which may have been expected. But they also entirely exonerated the Duke Company from all blame. This verdict came as a great shock to many who were aware of the company's failure to comply with the new safety regulations. The jury declined to comment on the matter of the safety cage in question, but an angry crowd of Duke Company miners had a lot to say to Robert Allen, the inventor, when they surrounded him as he left the hotel after the inquest. John Jones was committed for trial a few months later, where he was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to six months imprisonment in the Maryborough Jail. Charles Whiteley, James Rogan, William Jones and John Rogers were laid to rest in the Tymore and Maryborough cemeteries. Their funerals were attended by many and their loss was felt deeply. This accident, as shocking as it may have been, was just one of many fatal accidents which have occurred throughout the gold mining history of Victoria. Now and then you will come across a lonely monument set alongside the remnants of an old mine, listing the names of a handful of ill-fated men. Fortunately, mining accidents are rare these days, as each disaster of the past brought more and more safety devices and procedures into action. If you visit the Grand Duke in Timor, take a moment to remember the four men who fell on that terrible day, and the eight others who lost their lives here during the mine's 27 years of operation. 216,000 ounces of gold, but what a terrible price was paid. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to learn more about the fascinating gold mining history of Victoria, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.